Hello again, everyone. Here we are, last topic in our chapter three, biological molecules. Our last group are the nucleic acids. All right, so nucleic acids are polymers, just like carbohydrates and proteins. Okay, but unlike fats, remember fats are, are not polymers. Nucleic acids represent uh, the last group of biomolecules and include following two classes, DNA and RNA, which I'll let you watch the video here below to sort out what that means. I want you to figure that out. What do DNA and RNA stand for? You're gonna watch this video. And if you remember, just like the previous video that we watched on protein structure, if you go to the Moodle um, and just to the chapter three videos just above where you're at now, Click on that and you scroll down to page uh, six here, nucleic acids, and you'll see that video there. So pause this video, have a watch. What you're going to do is uh, I'd like you to try and come up with all the differences between DNA and RNA and write those differences here. Or maybe if you want to write them on a scrap sheet of paper, just before you write them into your notes, that becomes concrete. All right, pause the video and then start back up to finish off the notes. Okay, so uh, DNA and RNA, you should have discovered, stand for deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. And so in a moment here, we're gonna see the building blocks, ribonucleic acid, we'll see the building blocks to DNA and RNA, and we'll understand that in those building blocks, those monomers are sugars, and the sugars differ. So that's one of the differences, is the difference in sugars in the nucleotide. The sugar in DNA is deoxyribose, and the sugar in RNA is ribose. And so, that's one fundamental difference. The next thing that you notice is, uh, as you see in the picture here, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. So it's made up of two strands that are weakly joined together, so double-stranded, whereas RNA tends to be a single-stranded molecule. It does kind of fold back in on itself in different, uh, different types of RNA, but it, it ultimately is a single strand. Uh, what else we got? Double-stranded, single-stranded. Um, they differ in the types of nucleotides. So nucleotides. Now I'm just gonna abbreviate, abbreviate their names here just for simplicity, but you should write their names out and we will, well, we will actually be doing that down below in number two, but in the video, you should have heard adenine, which we abbreviate with A, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Those are the nucleotides and the nitrogenous bases that exist in DNA. RNA also has adenine, but it replaces thymine with a nucleotide called uracil, or a nitrogenous base, I should say, called uracil. And there are cytosine and guanine as well. So they differ in the types of nucleotides, and they also di differ in their um, in their size. DNA is a much larger molecule. I mean, it's probably one of the biggest molecules in your cell, so it's much larger. DNA is, or sorry, RNA is a bit smaller. And they uh, they differ in function as well. And so, whereas DNA carries our genetic code, and uh, and determines our traits and characteristics, RNA's role is in the actual manufacturing of proteins, or what we call protein synthesis. So, these represent the functions. So they differ structurally, they differ in function. I should say that their functions are connected. And so it's it's our genetic code that ultimately determines pro protein synthesis, right? So, so this here determines 
protein synthesis. So they're definitely connected in their function. One doesn't occur or the one's function doesn't occur without the function of the other, but they have different roles within that function. All right. So getting into the details of the monomers, okay. Um, maybe I'll get you to pause the video. Think about this question for a second. What are the monomers to the other polymers we've discussed so far? Okay, so there's a question. Identify the monomers to the polymers in our discussion of biological molecules. Pause that video, give it some thought, and then turn the video back on to see if you're on the right track. All right, if you were thinking about that correctly, one polymer is carbo are carbohydrates, and the monomer or the building block to carbohydrates is glucose, right? The other polymer uh, that we've talked about are proteins. The building block or the monomer to proteins are amino acids. And then our monomer or building blocks to nucleic acids. Uh, so we refer to our nu nucleic acids as polymers as well. They're built from repeating units of nucleotides. And so just to make sure you didn't include fats into this group of polymers because they're not polymers, they're not built from repeating units, right? The nucleotide, the, the building block to DNA and RNA, has also some components that make up the nucleotide. So this whole structure collectively, the yellow, green, and blue parts, are what we refer to as a nucleotide. The nucleotide has three parts. It has a sugar, it has a phosphate, and it has what we call a nitrogenous base. Some of these should be familiar to you. The phosphate, right, we've talked about previously when we talked about, um, you know, if we scroll up here and we look at our phospholipids, well, we can see that same yellow highlighted phosphate group, whoops, that's a little bad, containing a phosphorus and four oxygen molecules attached to it, right? So that should be familiar to you. As far as the sugar goes, we learned in carbohydrates that sugars are ring-like structures consisting of carbons, right? So we can see here, even though we don't draw them, it should be inferred that there are carbons at each of those points. In that blue molecule, this is our sugar. This is where they differ, DNA and RNA. In DNA, that sugar is what's called a deoxyribose. So they're both ribose sugars, but in DNA, it's missing an oxygen, hence deoxyribose. And in RNA, it's ribose. It has the oxygen for that, for that sugar ribose, which it normally should. So that's the blue group. And then the green group up here is what is referred to as the nitrogenous Base. One of the things that will help you to remember stuff is to think about the names in a way that makes sense. I know sometimes scientific terms, sorry. Okay, sorry, I've forgotten where I was, but I think I was somewhere here around uh, the nitrogenous base. All right, so what's interesting about, again, I think I was trying to talk about how uh, the names of substances should really help you understand a little bit about their structure or even what they do. We'll see that throughout the course. This is a nitrogenous base, this green structure up here. And we know that bases tend to remember accept protons in solution. They tend to accept hydrogen ions. And that's, this structure has that ability to do that. And that's why it's referred to as a base. It's nitrogenous because it contains many nitrogen atoms. And normally in these ring structures, like here where there's nothing, is actually a carbon. And here's a carbon, and here's a carbon. Normally that's what we anticipate in these ring-like structures. But in this case, it has lots of nitrogens in it, which makes it a nitrogen space. So that is the building block to DNA and RNA. They're called nucleotides. There are in total five different kinds of nucleotides. Um, I'm just going to minimize this little piece here. There are five different nucleotides that you can see in the bases of DNA. There is adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. 
and the same thing in RNA, adenine, guanine, and cytosine, with the exception of thymine. In RNA, there is uracil, which is this one down here. And you can see they're, they're actually in the same category. So there's two categories of the nitrogen spaces. The purines are double ring structures, and the pyrimidines are single ring like structures. And so even replacing thymine with uracil, it's still a single ring structure, but just slightly different in the RNA. All right. Um, as we've maintained a theme throughout the course, structure dictates function. And uh, that couldn't be more clear if you look at how the nucleotides string together to make this double helix of DNA. So I always like to think of DNA as this sort of ladder-like structure that's twisted. If you were to imagine to grab a ladder at the top and the bottom and just kind of twist it, you get this helix-like shape. But what's unique about this structure is you can see these dotted lines connecting the two sides of the ladder. So we have this side over here and, and this side over here. The sides of the ladder, these blue sections going up and down here, you notice it goes from three to five, and on this side it goes in the opposite direction. These sides are what we call the sugar phosphate backbone, okay? So I don't know if I can fit that in there, but sugar phosphate backbone, all right? And what you notice is on this side, the oxygen of the sugar is sort of facing up, okay? And we're going from the five prime to the three prime, okay? And I'll talk about this later. It has to do with the numbers of carbons. You can see things numbered in here, one, two, three, four, five. So it has to do with, in this case, you can see we're going from number three, sorry, to number five. And here we're going from the number three carbon to the number five. So we're always proceeding in the three to five prime, okay? On this side, you can see the oxygen is facing towards the bottom or downwards and so three to five three to five so you can see this chain three to five okay that's the sugar phosphate backbone and then towards the center the rungs of the ladder are the nitrogenous bases and you can see that they pair in a very particular manner a pairs with t c pairs with g and it is uniform throughout all life right? From bacteria to complex organisms such as ourselves. The adenine and the thymine pair together. When the two sides of the DNA, the two sugar phosphate backbones line up in alternating directions, it almost creates a, a fit like a jigsaw puzzle. So you can see on the adenine, these exposed nitrogens, much like water is polar so are these nitrogenous bases. And on the other side, the thymine has H's. So you can see the nitrogens of the adenine are slightly negative, the hydrogens of the thymine are slightly positive, and this creates the hydrogen bonds that we see here, holding the rungs of the ladder together and holding the two sugar phosphate backbones of DNA together. All right. And, and how I mean structure serves function. Well, the whole point of DNA is our genetic code. And the genetic code is literally these A, T, C's, and G's. That genetic code is what will ultimately determine the proteins that are made in our body. And in order to access that code, well, the DNA strand has to be split apart. So here's this whole how structure serves function, right? If those bonds between the nitrogenous bases were strong covalent bonds, it would be really difficult to separate that um, molecule. But because they're hydrogen bonds, they're weaker forces of attraction, and it's much there's less energy required to sort of separate the strands of DNA and expose the genetic code to make proteins. So structure serves function. These H bonds are a critical component of the, the helical structure of DNA. 
Um, now, when we look at, uh, so that's the arrangement of nucleotides in DNA, and uh, they pair up forming two sides which spiral into an alpha helix shape. So we call this the alpha helix. All right. But this same kind of pairing between, even though, even though RNA is single stranded, right? We talked way back up here, looking at the uh, characteristics of RNA, even though RNA is single stranded in its process and its involvement of protein synthesis, it also requires pairing between other types of RNA. So down here, I put this up a little bit higher. Okay. The process of making a protein we'll get into in chapter five. But basically what you want to understand is the information of DNA is converted into a strand of mRNA. And this strand of mRNA is read to ultimately create the protein. That's a very superficial explanation of protein synthesis, but we'll cover it a lot more in chapter five. The point is, in the process of mRNA making a protein, it must pair up with some other partners, including tRNA and also this structure, this ribosome here, which we're going to look at in chapter four, which maybe you're already doing in your uh, presentation. But this ribosome is made out of rRNA, and the R stands for ribosomal RNA. The point is, is all three of these structures. RNA, tRNA, and mRNA are made up of nucleotides with the bases C, G, A, and of course U instead of T. So this, um, in order to build the protein, these different RNAs have to pair up together. So you can see A pairs with U, normally A pairs with T in DNA, but in RNA, A is going to pair with U in RNA. So A's and U's pair together, but C's and G's still pair together. So its structure serves function, okay? I want you guys to answer these three questions here, okay? And uh, I will go over them in class, but I want you to sort of try and figure out what the opposite strand would look like given each scenario. I'm going to finish off with the last important nucleotide that's uh, of significance in this discussion, and that is uh, our ATP, or what is commonly known as adenosine triphosphate. So our uh, adenosine triphosphate is a nucleotide just like any other. Um, it has a phosphate, but in this case, it actually has three phosphates, so hence the name. All right, so ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And again, that name comes from, so think of how name fits structure. This is, this structure here is the nitrogenous base adenine. So hence adenosine. Here's our sugar molecule, just like um, the others which is a key component to nucleotides. But instead of one phosphate, it has three phosphates. And why this molecule is essentially um, functions as the energy currency of the cell is because of these bonds here joining the phosphates together. These are very high energy chemical bonds. And when these bonds are broken, all right, when these bonds are broken, the energy released, the energy released drives other cellular processes, which we'll discuss throughout the course various cellular processes that, that govern, uh, you know, the, the various cellular processes that are the chemical reactions uh, throughout our cells and throughout our body. All right.
So sorry that went a little bit longer than anticipated, but uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. See you Monday morning.